let's get going. All right, I want to show some code. So first, let's talk about what is clean architecture. And you'll find various definitions. There, there's a, a whole book on the topic. Uh, it's very closely related to onion architecture, hexagonal architecture, or ports and adapters. I think uh, ports and adapters probably has the, the clearest name out of the bunch. Uh, hexagonal is a fun one because it's named that because somebody drew a hexagon when they were drawing the architectural diagram. So whatever shape you draw, that's what your architecture will be known as. Um, but the point of it is, in all these cases, is that we want to have a domain-centric approach to organizing our application and its dependencies. And so what do I mean by domain-centric? What else could it possibly be besides domain-centric? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, in the before times, a whole lot of applications were written with the database as the center of the universe. And there are a lot of trade-offs that happen when you design your software that way. Uh, trade-offs that often cause a lot of pain when you want to try and do things like find seams in your software so you can easily test it or, or change some of its dependencies. Uh, and so having this dependency on infrastructure be minimized is the key feature of this type of architecture. And there are trade-offs for that, right? It's not necessarily the, the best architecture ever, um, but it is a choice that you should be aware of. Uh, and it's a good fit for a lot of different options. So when would you use clean architecture? Well, uh, if you are a team that is comfortable with and, and practicing something like domain-driven design, and you really want the focus of your software to be on that domain model that you're creating, and not necessarily on all the infrastructure concerns and all the cool extra uh, dependencies and services that you're working with, then clean architecture really helps the team follow that, that guidance, make sure that everything does stay domain-centric, right? You can lean on the compiler to ensure that nobody intentional that on purpose, intentionally, or by accident, uh, is, is bringing in dependencies where they shouldn't. Um, and of course, another place where this shines is where you have complex business logic, where you really want to have a lot of automated testing of that logic to make sure that everything is working. Uh, and so, you know, between these two things, they, they go together very nicely because uh, domain-driven design is ideal for things that have a lot of domain complexity. Uh, and clean architecture is a way to guard against having those infrastructure concerns creep into your domain and make it more difficult for you to change it or test it uh, as, as demands uh, change and, and your understanding of the problem grows. All right, so you might choose clean architecture because you want the architecture to help enforce your policies rather than having to have disciplined developers who always do the right thing. All right, so if, if you are using C Sharp because you like that it has a strong uh, type system, and that the compiler will tell you when you try and pass a string into an int uh, parameter um, and, and you get an immediate feedback that says, hey, you can't do that because of that typing. Those kinds of constraints are the same type of thing that you get when you follow clean architecture as part of your, your architectural approach. Because what's going to happen is if someone tries to bring in a dependency on something that they shouldn't uh, in the domain model, for instance, the compiler will tell them, no, sorry, you can't do that. Uh, that's not how that works, right? The, the dependency won't work that way. Right. So historically, um, there's there's been various reasons why you might want to break up a solution into multiple projects and multiple logic, multiple logical layers. Um, and the traditional one that many of us are familiar with is is known as N tier. Uh, and this is kind of what I grew up with early in my career. Uh, and it was certainly an improvement over just having spaghetti code with all of these concerns mixed into the same files. Uh, but it does suffer from the fact that there are these transitive dependencies now where the database is dependent on by the data access layer, but the business layer depends on that and the UI depends on that. And so at the end of the day, everything ends up being dependent on the database. And if you wanna try and write unit tests for your business logic that don't involve the database, it can be difficult to do so depending on some other factors, but in general, it's not as easy as it could be. All right, so clean architecture, uh, to use a similar shaped diagram, uh, looks like this. So the user interface just depends on your domain model, your business layer, uh, and your infrastructure, which includes your data access, also depends on the business layer, right? So it's following the dependency inversion principle by using abstractions, by using interfaces. And so by placing those abstractions inside your domain model, it makes it so that the infrastructure layer can implement those abstractions and depend in that direction. And what that means is that the business logic can't possibly depend on your infrastructure layer can't possibly depend on the UI project. Now, if you put everything in one project and they're all in just in separate folders, you can absolutely ship successful software, but there will not be any guarantees from the compiler to tell you that the things that are in the domain folder are not having a dependency on the things that are in the infrastructure folder, right? if you have such folders. Uh, and so clean architecture 
gives you that constraint, gives you those guardrails to make sure that you're not accidentally introducing dependencies in places where you don't want them. All right, so another way to look at this, more of a hexagonal architecture approach, uh, is to say that at the center of your application, you have this core project with your domain model, and we'll talk more about what's in there in a second, um, and importantly, various abstractions. A lot of end-tier architecture stuff didn't use any abstractions, didn't need any abstractions. Everything just newed up whatever it needed or used static uh, references to it. Um, but it turns out abstractions have a lot of value, uh, and clean architecture and domain-driven design both benefit greatly by the proper use of certain abstractions. Um, with that central project having no dependencies on exterior things, your, your UI project, your infrastructure project, even your tests, all those things can depend inward, uh, and, and you don't have anything pointing outward from that core project. All right, so I have a template that's uh, available for you to use. Um, I'll show you how to use it here real quick. It's, it takes two lines of code. Um, so if you run out here to uh, NuGet and you grab this bit of code right here to, to install this preview um, of the .NET 8 version of this, then you can come into PowerShell. And I've actually got preview two uh, just released like an hour ago. And if you hit enter, it'll install it. And I've already installed it, so it's there already. Uh, but then if you want to uh, create it, you just do this and say .NET new clean arch uh, dash n and give it whatever name you want, usually as, as two values, a company name dot project name, right? And if you do that, uh, it's going to go ahead and create it. You can just CD into it and see what's there. And you can do a you know, .NET build and everything should work. Uh, and just like that, you have this solution template. Uh, one of the things that's nice about this is that you don't have to produce all those different projects with all the right dependencies in the right directions, right? It's not huge. It's only about seven projects and that includes three test projects, um, but not having to do it yourself saves you a bunch of tedium. I, I know I have to set up projects fairly frequently uh, and it's it's really painful to have to create this, this web project and then this class library and then this other class library and then these test projects, right? So this saves you some of that. Um, and that's that's really all there is to it, right? We're gonna look more at what that template gave you in just a second, um, but that's all you need to do to get started with it. All right, and if you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, doesn't matter either way, it's just those two lines uh, in, in PowerShell or, or your terminal, works fine on a Mac, right? It's .NET Core, uh, and, and you're good to go. All right, so now let's talk about the rules of clean architecture. And so the first rule is that you wanna model all of your business rules and your, your entities that you're gonna track the state of inside of the core project, right? That's your domain model if you're following domain-driven design. And that's the thing that you wanna concentrate all of your complexity in and not let any business logic leak out of there. Um, or other types of logic, like data access logic, right? You don't want that scattered all over the application either, right? You wanna be able to have a, a central place where all that logic lives because it makes it easy to test and it makes it independent from infrastructure concerns. Then the second rule, is that all the dependencies need to flow toward the core project, right? Nothing goes from core toward your UI, toward your infrastructure, toward external dependencies, right? Everything has to flow toward the core. Uh, and then that gives you this, this third rule, which is kind of a, you know, follows on from number two, which is that your inner projects are going to define interfaces that your outer projects then implement. And that's how we're gonna use the dependency inversion principle to support uh, this, this basic setup where uh, we have code that depends inward instead of the other way around. Okay, so there's usually about three projects involved. You can have four, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this core project. So let's say, what goes into your core project inside of a clean architecture solution? Where, where do you put stuff when you have you know, these different buckets in which you wanna place things? And so I've mentioned interfaces. And so most of your interfaces are gonna live in the core project, and that's gonna make them available for any other project to access, uh, or, or even the core project itself, right? So you'll have a bunch of interfaces in there for various things that you need to do. Um, and when you're thinking about interfaces, if you haven't used them uh, a ton, um, the thing about interfaces is that they should focus on what needs to happen. The implementation of the interface should focus on how, right? So I might have an interface that says I send email. Well, there's a bunch of different ways I could send email. I could send it with SMTP locally. I could send it with uh, a third-party service like SendGrid or MailChimp or, or something else. Um, and so how I send it should not be part of the interface, right? I should be able to implement that interface in a bunch of different ways to do that how, all right? So the other things you're gonna have in here are gonna be your actual domain model types uh, of things that are gonna get persisted generally. And that's gonna include your aggregates, your entities, and your value objects. 
Entities is just anything that has an identity. So all those things that you store in your database that have an ID field, those are entities. Value objects are things that you compare just based on their properties. So a date time is an example of a value object. Uh, you can store a date time in an entity, right? And so frequently your value objects will be properties of your entities. And then an aggregate is just a way to group together several entities together that have some relationship where they're part of the whole. Uh, you can think of like a, a purchase order with line items or an order with detail rows, um, something usually like has a master detail relationship. And so that hierarchy can be grouped together as an aggregate, and then it gets, it gets persisted as a unit. So when you grab it from the database, you get the whole thing. And when you store it, you store the whole thing. Um, and that allows the aggregate to enforce certain rules or invariants uh, as part of the persistence uh, operation. So you can't just go grab an individual uh, line item on a purchase order and, and update its amount without the purchase order header knowing that, hey, now it might be over the limit. Um, you want to make sure the aggregate is involved in that operation. You may also have some domain services. These are mostly an outlier. Uh, this is where you put logic that can't go in any of your entities or aggregates or, or value objects. Um, and so usually this is stuff that has to orchestrate between uh, different aggregates or entities. But uh, you may have domain exceptions. Um, these are domain specific things that might go wrong that you know could go wrong. And you want to save future you some headaches by instead of just letting a null reference exception bubble up, um, you're going to create a custom exception that says, you know, customer doesn't exist exception or something like that. Um, and then when you see that exception in a stack trace, you know exactly what the problem is. You don't have to go wonder, well, wonder what was null. Um, so it can save you a lot of trouble. You, might, you may also use domain events and domain event handlers. Uh, domain events are things that are interesting inside of your domain that when they happen, something else maybe ought to happen, right? Or somebody wants to know about this. If you're looking at some of the new stuff coming with .NET 8 with metrics and traces and, and things like that for observability, domain events can also tie into that really nicely. So if you want to know every time somebody you know adds an item to the cart, you could have a domain event for that. And in addition to other domain behavior, you might also want to hook into that for you know having some type of a trace or, or mechanism to, to see a counter for that. Um, domain events are a really nice way to decouple things so that if you have a big workflow where, you know, when someone checks out of their cart, you have to check inventory, process their credit card, create an order, send them an email, send somebody else an email, send something to the warehouse, right? There's this whole laundry list of things that have to kick off. Um, with domain events, what you can do is just update the, the order that you're creating and save it, fire off a domain event that says new order created, and you're done. Right. All those other follow-on things and, and the three more that happen you know, next, in the next few months as additional features um, all get added as handlers. Right? So they, they don't uh, have to get added to the existing function. They can be added as additional classes and additional uh, behavior that's outside of the state of the order that's changing, that's triggering all of that, all of that behavior. All right. You may also have specifications here. Specifications are an excellent and underused pattern for defining queries. Uh, and so if you have a problem when you look at your code and there is just link statements everywhere uh, where you're trying to, to fetch a certain you know, type of object or make sure it includes these rows or make sure it has this filter on it, uh, and, and it's in your services and it's in your views and it's in your controllers and it's in your endpoints, um, everywhere there's link, right? Specifications help you pull that stuff back into your domain model where it's centralized, it's testable, they're well-named, and they're easy to reuse, right? So you don't end up with different blobs of, of link code in different places. Uh, you might have validators here, you might have enums in here, you might have custom guard clauses that you've defined to make sure that certain edge cases or invariants never happen. Um, all that stuff could be in here. And with that, let's look at a quick demo of it. So we're going to go to this sample project right here, and we're going to jump up to this core project and uh, look at just some of the folders in here, right? So there are two aggregates in this sample, and this sample is in my clean architecture uh, repo. Um, there are contributors and there are projects. Uh, and, and in this example, you know, a project is uh, something with a bunch of to-do items on it, and contributors are people that work on items, right? So think of it like a simple task tracking system. All right, and so right away when you look at this, because you can see it's, it's all about contributors and projects, you get some idea of what this is. Like this is not a banking ap application, this isn't an insurance application, it's not an e-commerce application, it's got contributors and, and projects, and I just told you what those mean. So you, you can see kind of what the design is from there. Um, and then inside of those, they may have certain specifications that say how to fetch them. 
right? There's a get, get a contributor by ID as a specification. There's for projects, they have children like to do items. So they're a hierarchy. That's why they're an aggregate. And they have a, spec, a, a few specifications where you can say, give me all the incomplete items or give me a project with its items. Um, so it just looks like this. And so essentially these specifications are very simple, but they, they have a name and you can reuse them. Uh, as far as the entities themselves, they're just standard uh, entities. But one thing they have is a lot of the, the, the business logic is encapsulated inside of them. So instead of having a lot of logic inside your controller, your endpoint, or some service in between, right? you are able to put most of your logic inside the entities where you can test it. Uh, and this is just a sample app, so there's not a ton of logic here. Um, but, but that's the general idea is that's where it would go if you had more complexity. Uh, there's domain events. So when you add an item to a project that has a domain event that's registered here, and then you could have domain event handlers. Uh, I don't have one for that handler just a second, but we're going to see in a minute this uh, item completed email notification handler. And so the thing about handlers that's nice is that they can use dependency injection. Um, and so in here, I can pass in a service for sending email that it can then use to, to send the email. Now, because that, that service is just an abstraction, I don't actually know how it's going to send the email. I just know that's what it wants to do. But I, I didn't have to do it inside of the place where it was triggered, which in this case was... Uh, right here inside this mark complete method, right? So mark complete is able to run without having to have any dependencies um, and still trigger things that need dependencies in order to happen. So that's one of the beauties of using domain events. All right, so that's the core project. Um, if there's questions, you know, I'll catch them at the end. You can always find me on Twitter. So let's let's jump back and talk about the next thing, which is command query responsibility segregation which is an optional design that you can in include in your architecture if you want. It has various benefits that I don't have time to get into right now. And you can achieve this most easily in a separate project that sits between the user interface and your domain model. And this is sometimes called use cases or sometimes a set of app services, all right? And so the things that belong in here are gonna be uh, these sorts of things, commands and handlers, queries and query handlers, various DTOs that, that support these commands and queries uh, and behaviors. And we'll see what behaviors are in just a second. All right, so let's look at use cases. And in here again, same project, we're gonna look at the uh, use cases project right here. And here's projects and contributors are the top level things. And under there, there's various operations or, or things that you can do with those domain types. Um, so one of the things we could do is, is mark a to-do item as complete. That's a command. To do that command, I just need to know the project ID and the item that you want to mark complete. And I have a handler here that's going to accept a command. It's a, it's a command handler, and it's going to return back some result that's going to say whether or not the command was successful. Um, inside of here, it's going to use a specification to go and find the appropriate item or return not found. Uh, and same thing, that's, that's the project that it's looking up. But then uh, here is the actual item on the project. When it's done, it's going to call that mark complete. Uh, method on the entity itself, um, and then save the changes. When it saves the changes, that's when domain events get fired, that's when those get handled, and when it's all done, it's gonna return success. Um, so that's an example of how you can easily support CQRS. Uh, some folks might prefer to have a root level folder on here that's like commands and queries, so it's really obvious that you're doing CQRS. Uh, I find that it's sufficient to just lead with your actual domain types here, uh, and then it's pretty obvious in here which ones are queries and which ones aren't, like get with all items, that is a query. Right? It, it's using an iQuery type, uh, and it has a query handler that, that is doing it. So you can see from the files themselves whether or not they're commands or queries, um, but you don't necessarily need to use a folder structure for that if you don't want to. All right, so now let's jump back here and talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure is where the actual how things happen happens in your application. And so it's going to have things for persistence. Uh, Domain-driven design uses a pattern called the repository for persistence. You're probably familiar with it. Um, it can use any type of implementation for that, entity framework or Dapper, uh, custom ADO.net, whatever you like. Uh, and then by using this abstraction, you can easily decorate it with things like caching uh, to make it so that you don't have to build caching inside of your, your actual services or other places in your code. You can just create a caching object that wraps around your repository and adds caching when and where needed. Uh, and the specification pattern that I'm using has a, a Boolean on it that you can just say, enable caching, right? So any specification that should support caching can just turn that on. And if you have a cached repository, then it just it gets caching, right? It's super easy. You don't have to change it anywhere. 
Um, it's going to have API clients for when you call third-party APIs. It's going to have various ways to access the file system or to send emails or SMS, maybe to access the system clock. Uh, and it could have other services and even some of its own interfaces. But the only interfaces that should go in here are ones that have dependencies on infrastructure. So if the uh, interface itself returns something like an Azure blob storage item, right? well, we don't want to have an Azure blob storage item in an interface in core, because that would tie us to Azure. But it's certainly fine to have that as an interface inside of infrastructure, um, but it's only going to be used internally here. All right, so let's look at that uh, real quick. So in the infrastructure project, there's not a whole lot here. Right? I've got a way to send email by faking it. Uh, I've got a way to send email for real. And this one's just using local SMTP. Uh, and then under data, there's interesting stuff here. Um, there's my EF repository. Not a whole lot going on here because it's inheriting from a third party uh, package. And then the app DB context, which just has my DB sets for the things I'm using. Uh, and then a little bit of code in here under save changes where it's going to dispatch domain events. Right? And so that's how that magic kind of works in this particular design. Um, inside here, the, the queries allow you to you know, write queries however you want. So um, you don't have to use repositories for your querying. And that's a problem many teams run into is they think, oh, we're using repository. We have to use it for everything. And then they bang their head against the wall for hours trying to figure out the proper link query to do some crazy SQL, right? When you want to do a query, you're not returning back your domain model. You're just returning back some query results. And how you get those results is just whatever the most efficient way is. And oftentimes, that's just going to be SQL, right? So just write the query that you need, get back the results you need uh, in whatever DTO uh, format you need, not necessarily a domain type, because you're not doing any domain logic on these things, typically. You're just presenting them to the user. Uh, so in the cases where you're just presenting data to the user, don't feel like you have to jump through all the hoops of using a repository to do it. All right, so that's infrastructure. Uh, in the web project, all the web stuff goes there. I'm going to go super fast because I'm running out of time and I want to show more code. But if it has to do with ASP.NET Core, probably goes inside the web project. Also, that's where your composition root is going to be. That means that's where you're going to wire all your services up to their interfaces. Uh, you might have other services and interfaces here too. Same rules apply as infrastructure. The only reason you're going to have services and interfaces here is if they have uh, elements in them that are tied to web. Right. So if you have an interface that returns back a view model, uh, it has to live here because that's where the view models are defined, um, for example. All right, so if we look at our web project, in this example, I'm actually using a project called Fast Endpoints. And Fast Endpoints is nice because it leverages minimal APIs. So it has all the speed of minimal APIs. But instead of you having to have like some crazy long program CS full of Lambda expressions for all your queries, or sorry, for all your endpoints, um, each endpoint is just one uh, file. So if I want to create a project, this is the uh, endpoint. It inherits from endpoint of request comma response. So it's using the Reaper pattern. That's request endpoint response, R-E-P-R, -E Reaper. Uh, and so these are just using mediator to send off commands. That's because I'm using that use cases project. If I weren't using that project, I would just be interacting directly with the domain model here. Uh, and I, I would just cut that project out of the mix. Um, but in here, these are all very simple. These are all just do something with mediator, get back a result, and return it. Um, so that's create, you know, delete looks you know, much the same, take a command, send it, and take the result, return it. Uh, so the point, point here is that your endpoints should be super thin uh, because they're harder to test than most other things. Um, and so this way, you don't have a lot of logic inside of your web layer. Most of that logic should be inside of your domain layer. Um, Let's see, there's not a whole lot else here. One, one thing about this pattern, uh, if, you, if you structure it correctly, uh, is that you can chain this so that all the DTOs that work with it are, are grouped with it inside Visual Studio. And that's just because of the naming convention. If you put create dot in front of these types, they will, they will chain with create. So here's the request. Uh, I like to put the route on here too, so I don't have that magic string floating around and I can access that from my tests. Uh, here's the response that comes back with the, uh, the item that was uh, created, the project that was created. And if you set up a validator, this is using um, Fluent Validation, uh, this stuff is automatically hooked up with fast endpoints. So just by it existing here, it's going to get called as, as part of the process. All right, so shared kernel is something you might share between different solutions. It's a DDD term, holds common types between stuff. Uh, ideally, you distribute it as a NuGet package. Uh, I have all this stuff here in mine. Uh, you should have your own for your company and your teams. Uh, you can grab the one that I use, uh, which is this Ardalis uh, shared kernel. That's another NuGet package out there. So the sample I've been showing you uses this. So like the, the base entity type is here. Um, it, it goes off of this has domain events base 
which just has this collection of domain events here that, that you can use uh, and register and clear. And then the uh, dispatcher that's used that I showed you in Save Changes um, is in here as well, right? And as well as everything else that I use, like the, the value object type that I use is in here um, that, that handles how value objects work, all right? Last thing we want to do is just show a quick demo. So in app.http, if we run the app, make sure it's running. Um, we just send a request here. That's working. All right. So we can go find a specific project uh, like this one, I think. And it's going to say, here's this project. And this one's not done, but or this one is done. This one's not. So number two is not done. So let's just send a request here to mark an item as complete. And, and I just got a notification. And that notification is telling me that I just got an email that, hey, this, this task review solution was completed a few seconds ago. And this is using Papercut, which is a local SMTP server that you can use for that kind of testing. Uh, and so you can kind of see that the whole thing went through. Uh, the endpoint hit, it uh, picked up the entity, it marked it complete, it fired off a domain event. The domain event had a handler that sent an email. I got the email and, and everything worked uh, just the way you would expect. And this is using the new uh, HTTP files that you can add in Visual Studio. So you don't even have to use Swagger or Postman. All right. How much time do I have? About four minutes. Um, that was the main thing I wanted to show. I think we're doing all right. So uh, run the sample app, and here's some resources. And then let's see if there's any questions. Whew. That was quick. That was quick. <laughs> that was great, great, great job. Actually, I do have a couple. There was more conversations than questions, but they were. I was able to pick two of them up. One was from the beginning of the session, mm -hmm. and it's just from Gabriel. Uh, who has is that when would you use clean architecture and when would you use a vertical slice architecture? I prefer clean architecture most of the time, but I do work in vertical slices. So mm -hmm. you know the idea of a vertical slice meaning that you're going to build a feature by by building the UI you need, whatever services you need, whatever infrastructure you need, whatever domain, okay, that whole slice through the system. That's how I work. That's how I ship stuff. But as far as the architecture goes, I like the the guardrails and and the protections that clean architecture gives me so that I can have the testability. So um, I don't, I'm not usually a fan of, of just, you know, YOLOing it and throwing everything right. in one project and, and using the VSA approach. So you do it. So the way you, you're explaining it, you do both, right? So you still do the mm -hmm. clean architecture for the structure and the layout of the way you're doing it, but you're saying I'm shipping this slice, like from beginning right. to end. That's right. No, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, then uh, Friedman asked, why do you focus on specifications and say, instead of CQRS? Which is funny because he asked it before you talked about CQRS. <laughs> I, I, again, I do both, right? You, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, specifications are a way to keep Link from polluting your entire code base. Right. Link, Link is great, but there's so many applications you go look at. And like everything that touches any part of the, the system has some Link in it that's manipulating the query. Right. Uh, and especially if people are passing around iQueryable, um, all of those oh, things yeah. could actually be manipulating the actual query that's going to get run. And so when there's a performance problem or, or any other issue and you're trying to figure out, well, where is that issue coming from? It could be anywhere. It could be in the, in the data access layer, the business service, right. the controller, the view, anywhere in between. Yeah, I mean, Link is great, but like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery, sl leaky abstraction, yes, <laughs> right? Yes. And so specifications so. are great because they're, they're, they're there, they're, they're reusable, they're, they have a name. Like the thing right. about link expressions, they don't have a name unless you like right. assign it to a variable, which no one ever does. Um, whereas specifications, they have that name so you can kind of get a catalog of them and see like, oh yeah, right. that's the one I need and, and you're good to go. Yeah, which is funny because even with links, some people, and I've done this myself, right? And, and it all depends on what the, the thing you're doing. You may do it more like a query syntax rather than the extension method syntax, right? Because because right. because one lends itself nicer for this type of to this type of query and the other one lends right. itself for the yeah, other. Especially kind of if you're things. doing joins and projections and so Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's way cleaner to do it one way than the other. Right. So awesome. Well, uh, there is a bunch of other uh, comments and questions. So if you want to go look at YouTube, Steve, you're more than welcome to. Uh, there, there, there's great, great content here. And I think uh, a lot of people are more asking, it's like, hey, how would you do that? How would you do Y? Right. Which is difficult uh, because you always got to know the context in which they're looking at it from. Yep. And, awesome. and there's a, a Microsoft sample, one last thing, called eShop on yeah. web that also oh, yeah. follows this. So it's yeah. different awesome. from the eShop they just announced, but it's another good sample. Yep. And it's a, and it was one of your resources, right? That, That's right. Uh, one of the links you showed there. Great. Awesome. Yep. Well, Steve, thank you so much for taking Thanks, the time. Tom. A lot of content. And we really appreciate you always uh, t donating your time to .NET Conf. Thank you.